Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to welcome everyone here this afternoon for what promises to be a, a most stimulating talk and discussion led by Ari Shavit, the acclaimed author of My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel. Uh, this is a work that has resonated in the hearts and minds of many Americans, uh, especially the American Jewish community. My Promised Land speaks to the complexities, both the triumphs and the tragedies, that are part of any country's true history, be it Israel or, or any other. I am Rabbi Edward Boraz, the Michael Steinberg 61 Rabbi of Dartmouth College Hillel, and the rabbi of the Upper Valley Jewish community. We want to begin by thanking Hillel International, situated in Washington, DC, for being the primary sponsor of this event. Because of their generous support, this program is made possible. I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors. These are the Tucker Foundation, the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, specifically Daniel Benjamin, Ambassador at Large, the Norman E. McCullough, Junior Director of the Center, the Rockefeller Center under the leadership of Professor Andrew Samrick, Jewish Studies and its chair, Professor Ehud Ben-Or. Student organizations serving as co-sponsors include, of course, Dartmouth College Hillel, J Street U, and Dartmouth Students for, for Israel. I want to thank my wonderful staff, Claudia Palmer, Emma Wunsch, and our student interns, Asaf Zilberfarb, Nicholas Perillo, Ashley Lockett, and Jacob Savas. Finally, Ari Shavit is this year's Daniel and Tamara Nixon Scholar in Residence. While the Nixons could not be here today, they send their well wishes to everyone here and are very grateful to be a part of this event. His visit this morning has been marked by engaging both our students and faculty in an exploration of our relationship to Israel, to Judaism, and even Dartmouth life here. He is unique in that he seems far more interested in us than in presenting his own ideas. Of course, we are here this afternoon today to listen and to learn from one of the most influential writers on Israel and Jewish life today. But none of this is possible without the leadership of those who are part of Dartmouth College Hillel uh, particularly its student board. To formally introduce Ari Shavit, please welcome Dartmouth College Hillel student president, Axel Hufford. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much, Rabbi. And thank you, students and community members, for joining us today, along with Hillel International, for bringing our speaker to campus. I'm Axel Hufford, Dartmouth Hillel's student board president, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Mr. Ari Shavit. Mr. Shavit is a leading Israeli columnist and author. In the 90s, he was chairperson of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, and in 1995, he joined Haaretz, where he now serves as senior correspondent and as a member on the editorial board. Last year, Mr. Shavit published New York Times bestseller, My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel named one of the best books of the year by New York Times Book Review and The Economist. My Promised Land examines the past, present, and future of the state of Israel and remains thought-provoking, heartfelt, and powerfully compelling throughout. As Shavit concludes in his book, the Jewish state does not resemble any other nation. What this nation has to offer is not security, nor well-being, or peace of mind. What it has to offer is the intensity of life on the edge. Today's lecture is titled, 21st Century Zion, America, Israel, and the Challenges of a New Era. Without further ado, please welcome Ari Shavit. Uh, thank you so much for your good words, and thank you so much for being here. I really didn't expect to find anyone here in this weather. <laughs> Now, as, as I was uh, driving up here yesterday from Boston, this is the last stop in a 10 campus tour, I thought of uh, something I usually say when I talk about what I will not talk mainly today, which is about Zionism and my book. 
I quote our great leader, Chaim Weizmann, who used to say that uh, you don't have to be crazy to be a Zionist, but it helps. <laughs> so you don't have to be crazy to drive up to Hanover in the snow to give a lecture, but it helps. <laughs> But the reason I was so determined to do it, and I was determined to do it, and I'm so happy to be here, uh, there are several reasons. First of all, already the interaction I had this morning with so many wonderful young people that you have here. So apart from the spectacular beauty of your town and campus, which is not just beauty, because you feel there is something profound here. And actually, the snow just underlined it. So I'm so privileged to be a guest here. I was so enriched by the conversations I already had here. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation we'll have now, because I'll speak a bit, uh, but I'm really looking forward for the conversation, because I think all these issues, Israel, America in Israel, the Jewish life, and the Middle East are so sensitive, they're so charged, and they call for a much better, more profound and decent and civilized conversation than what we usually have. So I really hope we'll do that today. But I must begin with another point that makes me so emotional in being here. And there is a person I must mention who passed away many years ago. My dear friend, and in a sense my rabbi, was a professor here, a scholar. Rabbi Professor Arthur Herzberg. I learned a lot from him, and he, in many ways, was ahead of his time, because he was like the infant terrible of American Jewish community, in the sense that he was such a devoted Zionist, but very much a liberal, who saw right from the beginning how occupation and settlements are dangerous for our own existence and our own soul. He paid a very high price for his position that was so brave and, in my mind, wise. And standing here, coming here, I cannot help but thinking about him. And there's just one thing that he told me that I must share with you. Arthur, who was obviously religious, he was a conservative rabbi, said that the most sacred place for him in Israel in the land of Israel, was not the Wailing Wall or the tomb of the patriarchs. It was the passport station in Ben Gurion Airport. Because he remembered how his family stood in line in the 1930s in East Europe, trying to get a visa to come to this country, and trying to get a visa to get to, to some other democracies but they were not given that reason. So they had to stand in line for the Panama consulate and the Chinese consulate and all kind of wild solutions. And some of them never got any visa. So for him, the fact that there is a place, there is a nation where every Jew can come at any time, that made Israel sacred. And, as he used terms that are now a bit more controversial, but were then very much upheld by liberals in this country, he said that anyone who has issue with this matter must understand that after what they've been through, the Jews deserve a kind of affirmative action for at least a century. Because after being homeless, and after being persecuted, the way they were, they really need and deserve a home of their own. So I could not but share with you this thought of Arthur Herzberg before we discuss the issues of the day that totally, totally connect to this fundamental issue. This summer and this year, 2014, the one that we just said goodbye to, it was a traumatic year. I'm afraid it might have been a watershed year. Israel was confronted by Hamas. America was confronted by ISIS. And the Jewish people were confronted by some old hates 
we thought are gone. So let me begin by discussing these traumas and their implications. I'll begin with our own. I have a 10-year-old boy called Michael and a five-year-old boy named Daniel. Early July, I realized what was about to happen and I walked into the room of my two American-like boys who really looked like American boys in every way. They wear the same clothes, they listen to the same music, they disappear in the same iPads. <laughs> and I told these privileged, somewhat spoiled, wonderful, beloved boys of mine that in the coming days, they will hear a sound they never heard before, the howling sound of sirens. Michael was born just as the first or the second intifada subsided and suicide bombing stopped. Daniel was born deep into Israel's calmest decade. They grew up in a high-tech Israel, prosperous Israel, consumerist Israel, that in many ways detached itself from the reality surrounding it. In recent years, although we did not have peace, Less Israelis and less Palestinians were killed than in most recent decades. As I said, no peace, but relative calm. And I knew that this was about to change. Two days later, the howling sound of sirens. And as we went down into the basement of our nice American-like home, in our nice American-like suburb, Michael asked if a missile might hit our house and destroy it. And Daniel asked if Iron Dome might be broken. So I thought of some previous sirens I remember. In 1967, when I was nine years old, we feared the worst. The older people actually feared there would be a new Auschwitz. In 73, we were so arrogant and self-confident, the sirens howled again and we almost lost. Our great, famous, heroic Moshe Dayan feared it was the end of the Third Temple. 1991, many people forget that, Saddam Hussein sent his Scud missiles to Israel and we feared some of them might have chemical warheads in them. And I'll never remember, never forget the moment. I went to the apartment. I lived, I was a young couple, a young journalist. I went to the apartment of our neighboring elderly couple who were Auschwitz survivors, who survived the worst, immigrated to America, and then decided to make Aliyah. And when I had to put over their faces the gas masks while they were shivering, I was thinking about the fate of my people, our people. How is it that we experience what we experience, we ran away from it, and we ended up living in a situation that has such existential fears. But now it was the summer of 2013, blue skies, hedonistic Tel Aviv, and it was my own boys who were joining this sad Israeli ritual that they were not used to understanding, although they did not have the words to express it, that they are not like American kids, that they are facing something different, that the Israeli condition is a unique condition, because on the one hand, Tel Aviv is Amsterdam, but on the other hand, our Amsterdam is so close to Damascus. On the one hand, we have created a California, we have a Silicon Valley, we have the beach boys and beach girls, we have the blue skies and the sun we don't right have right now. And yet, our California is surrounded by such aggressive, violent forces. And my boys understood that, and I saw it in their eyes. What was the summer about? 
Israel, in many ways, was impressive on the defensive. Our society, although we had some dark, troubling phenomena on the fringes, generally proved to be resilient, united, and cohesive. We are also very impressive on the defensive with this system that everybody talks about, but I think much more should be said about, Iron Dome. In my mind, the engineers of Iron Dome should get the Nobel Peace Prize. Because if we do not have Iron Dome, hundreds of, hundreds of Israeli civilians would have been killed, Israel would have had to conquer the Gaza Strip, and then hundreds of Israeli soldiers would have been killed, and thousands and thousands and thousands of Palestinian civilians, innocent ones, would have been killed. The, re the result would have been the collapse of the peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan, Israel boycotted by Europe, and a wave of anti-Semitism throughout the world, including in this country, much worse than what we saw. All of this was prevented by this technological system that is so amazing. So Israel, Iron Dome, in many ways, is an icon of Israel at its best. While we see so many troubling phenomena in Israel, which I discussed, so many terrible mistakes with settlements and other issues, Iron Dome is how a high-tech democracy should defend itself when it's in danger. But Iron Dome is not only an icon for Israeli technological genius. It's an icon of how the American-Israeli alliance should work. When we see what we see these days, with such terrible mistakes made, unbearable patterns of behavior, endangering this essential alliance, Iron Dome is an icon of how the alliance should work. Because, with all due respect to the Israeli genius, without American support and generosity, we would not have had this system. I realize, so I hear, that your president and your Congress do not always see eye to eye. <laughs> this is the rumor I hear. On Iron Dome, everybody should get credit. President Obama, his administration and the White House, and Congress because they enabled this system to be, and that system saved us from a catastrophe which had been much, much worse. And yet, we should not elude ourselves. The summer was a horrible summer. I know personally the commanders of the Israeli army. I assure you, they are moderate, sane people. They did not want to use this massive firepower that we use. If it was up to them, we would not have had wars, and they are as realistic and dovish as possible. But because the Israeli military did not have a decisive solution to this challenge of this new warfare, we found ourselves using that terrible firepower in Gaza. And thousands of people were killed, and over 100,000 people remain homeless. I'm an Israeli, but there is not a day in my life that I do not think about my neighbor Palestinians. Their history, their suffering, and their arguing. And what happened to both Israelis who were traumatized like my boys, and worse, and to so many Palestinians who experienced such tragedy this summer. This is horrific. But it's not only that, because the result of this terrible round of violence is not stability. In the past, we had violence, but usually it ended with something that gave us several years of peaceful peace or stability. It's not clear that this is the result this time. We had a vacuum in the Middle East before Gaza. We have a vacuum in the Middle East after Gaza. Gaza border is not stable, the West Bank is not stable, and nothing is stable. So although it was so terrible, it's not clear that it bought us a decade of a truce. Everything in the Middle East right now is like nitroglycerin. Which leads me to your trauma. Would have anyone in this hall thought five years ago that we will see a phenomena as beheading, beheading on YouTube, 
beheading of innocent, good-willing Americans and Brits and Japanese, and now the burning of the Jordanian pilot. Five years ago, this would have, would have been perceived as a very, very bad film, a crazy film. We all wanted to believe that Middle East is approaching a point where it will become 21st century Europe. We never imagined so, such large parts of the Middle East will come 11th century Europe. So on the one hand, the trauma was these terrible events and the way they were projected and are projected in Newport, these images, the terrified Americans and others at the end of the summer and are still terrifying us to this day. But again, it's not only the events and images. Because as terrible as ISIS is, ISIS is only a symptom to a deep, deep regional malaise. So when you think about America, what do you see? 13 and a half years ago, your great country, your great democracy, was challenged. The wild Middle East came crushing into Manhattan and Washington. So the empire struck back. And the empire launched two wars. And America went as far as Afghanistan to destroy Al-Qaeda. And America tried to impose a Jeffersonian democracy on Iraq. Trillions of dollars, American lives, all this effort. And what's the outcome? Al-Qaeda on Israel's doorstep. Iraq, such large parts of Iraq, under the influence of ISIS. So what you have tried, and I'm not into the blame game, definitely as an, Amer as an Israeli, I'm only grateful to America, and I'm, don't, I'm not criticizing any American policy. But when you look at what has happened, when you look at what has happened, you're bewildered. Because you tried to fix the Middle East, and it didn't work. So you tried to run away from the Middle East. But that doesn't work either. So what do you do with the Middle East? The third trauma is the Jewish trauma. And it's not exactly the same as the Israeli one. Because so many Jews, definitely non-Jews, but so many Jews, of my generation, a bit older, a bit younger than me, wanted to hope anti-Semitism is gone. I grew up in the Israeli left, Israeli liberals, and I'm a Sabra, an Israeli boy. We wanted to believe that anti-Semitism is something that our right-wing leaders invented, that it was some manipulation. How can it be in this day and age but what we've seen this summer, and what we see to this day in Europe, is that 70 years after the last year of Auschwitz, so many of the nations that sent their Jews to Auschwitz have lost all shame. Some of the things we've heard in Germany this year, these months, were unheard of since 1945. So one has to acknowledge that this old hate that was with us for millennia, and we wanted to hope it subsided and it's gone, is not totally gone. And in this sense, you can be very proud of being Americans. Because it's so clear that although you have some problems in America, it's so different here than in Europe. Europe has a serious problem. And to this moment, I do not understand how is it we did not hear to this moment a new kind of European Emile Zola. How is it that non-Jewish, decent, liberal Europeans do not shiver when they see that Belgian paratroopers have to stand by a kindergarten in Brussels, the, king, the capital of Europe, to defend four-year-old boys just because they are Jews? Brussels. 2015, this is worse than what you had in 1954 with Brown against the Board of Education. 
How come there is no moral outcry? So these are the three traumas of the year. What is the significance of all this? The significance is that the bubbles we lived in have bursted. We in Israel lived in a bubble. We were victims of our own success. After the failure of the old peace process, we ignored reality. We got drunken by our high-tech success and our great Tel Aviv party, and I invite you all to see the high-tech success and join the Tel Aviv party. I understand you have some party here as well, but <laughs> Tel Aviv is quite, quite good. But because we were not directly affected, we ignored reality. The same applies to America. Because as I said, after you tried to do such great things and failed in such a grand manner, you began ignoring reality. And the same is for the Jewish people and the people who deal with the Jewish people who began overlooking this ancient hate that has not disappeared. So as we look outside of the bursted bubbles, what do we see? In the Middle East, I think that both your great democracy and our frontier democracy face three or four main, major challenges. One is Iran. Don't let ISIS make you forget Iran. And those of you who have anger, perhaps justified anger, regarding my prime minister, should not make that anger make you think that Iran is not an issue. The main mistake done by the Israeli government in recent years that they made Iran an Israeli issue, and to a large extent, a Benjamin Netanyahu issue. That was a major mistake. Because if Iran will go nuclear, our civilization will be challenged. It will change the world order and the way of life. If Iran will go nuclear, within weeks or months, Saudi Arabia will go nuclear. They have their bombs in Pakistan. They only have to ask FedEx to get them over. But it won't be only Saudi Arabia. Later on, the Gulf, some of the Gulf countries will buy that ability. Egypt will go nuclear. Algeria will go nuclear. Turkey will go nuclear. Israel will have to change its very responsible nuclear policy. We will have a multipolar nuclear system, something we never tried before, in the world's wildest region. Look at everything that's going on in the Middle East and inject nuclear capabilities into that. Imagine what would happen. I understand that some time ago, Prime Minister Olmert was here. I'm not a great fan of Prime Minister Olmert, and he's not enthusiastic about me either. <laughs> but some say that he instructed Israel to destroy the new Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007. As an Israeli, I cannot refer to that, whether it's true or not. But if it's true, Mr. Olmert should get another Nobel Prize. He might be otherwise engaged, but he... <laughs> because just imagine this Syria now, I'm not talking about 1945 or 1965. Now, as we speak, if there would have been a nuclear capability in Syria, how would the Middle East look now? As peaceful as it is now here in Hanover, I'm telling you, it wouldn't have been as peaceful. So just imagine, extrapolate from that, what will happen? The need to stop Iran is not an Israel issue. And my anger at my government is of making it such an issue. This should not be an issue for, this should be, everybody should be concerned. Republicans and Democrats, American and Europeans, Israelis and Chinese. Any citizen of the free world, I think any human. The greatest success of the international community in the last 70 years is controlling the nuclear genie since Nagasaki. If Iran will go nuclear, it, the genie will be out of the bottle. We will not have the old fear of a nuclear Armageddon, but the chances of having nuclear 9-11s will rise dramatically. And the 21st century will be about nuclear horror and nuclear terror. The second challenge facing us all, America and Israel, is the great Arab chaos. 
we were all so hopeful four years ago. Exactly now. We really believe the Google kids will rule Egypt. Some of my distinguished friends in the American media, really distinguished, compared the Arab Spring to the American Revolution. Well, well. Four years later, only in Tunisia there is some hope. I'm an Israeli, but I think about my Arab neighbors. What are the political options facing an Arab youngster, a man or a woman, like you people here? An Islamic theocracy, a military dictatorship, a reactionary monarchy, or bloody chaos? This is what we have. This is what we have. So many regions in the world moved forward. East Asia, South Asia, South America, East Europe. In the 1950s, Egypt and South Korea were pretty much the same. Where is South Korea and where is Egypt? And it's not as an Islamic issue as some people claim. I have no issue at all with Islam. I love and respect Islam. Look at Indonesia and Malaysia. I admire the people of Indonesia. It's wonderful to have a democracy here, but when you are poor, like the Indonesians, to work and build up a democracy the way they are building, that's amazing. But in the Middle East, you don't see that. The Middle East is politically dysfunctional. So what do we do with this? The third challenge is the Palestinian issue. I think you know where I stand. Throughout my adult life, I opposed occupation. The first words of mine that went into print were a peace movement leaflet warning how dangerous and catastrophic settlement building will be. So I'm totally against occupation and against settlements. In principle, ideologically, I'm totally with the two-state solution. And I am, I've not changed my mind. The present situation, the status quo, is the silent killer killing Israel from within demographically, morally, and politically. We must change the dynamics. But on the other hand, we have to address reality. We tried peace in 1993. You are now wrestling with an attempt to come to terms with Cuba, Castro's Cuba. Yasser Arafat was for us 100 times more radioactive than Fidel Castro. But we opened our hearts, we shook Arafat's hand on the White House lawn, we brought him back to Gaza. Five months later, the first bus exploded in Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv. We didn't give up. So our Prime Minister, Ehud Barak, went to Bill Clinton's peace summit in Camp David. Bill Clinton is the most qualified person to bring peace anywhere and definitely to the Middle East. He has the EQ, IQ, passion, compassion. He spent all his political capital in the last six months of his presidency. He studied Jerusalem. He knows Jerusalem better than New Hampshire, although New Hampshire is so important for the primaries. <laughs> and it didn't work. It ended up with the worst terror offensive we ever seen, with suicide bombing. My own cafe in Jerusalem was bombed. Thousands of Israelis got, got killed. As a result of the Israeli reaction, 3,000 Palestinians got killed. But we did not give up. Five years later come the extreme general, considered a warmonger, Mr. Ariel Sharon, whom I feared as a young student and peacenik. And he does what the international community asks him to do and what people like me ask him to do. He dismantles every settlement in Gaza, <coughs> takes out the settlers. Not one checkpoint remains is the result the emergence of a Palestinian Singapore, a Gaza Denmark. The result is a Hamas-controlled territory that fires rockets in Israel every few months. And we saw this summer how dangerous these rockets are. So we are in a bind. On the one hand, we must move forward. There is no way but the two-state way. No way. I'm willing to discuss it later. I totally reject the extremists of the extreme right and the extreme left who share this illusion of a one state. There is no such thing. We tried the one state solution in a country called Syria. 
We know how it works in the Middle East. We put Sunnis, Druze, Alawites in one country, and what, what happened? As long as there was a strong dictator, it somehow worked. It was no Sweden, but it worked. The moment the dictator became weaker, you have the worst bloodshed, and the world totally incompetent in dealing with this. So that's a one-state solution. Don't have that illusion. And I deeply disagree with the, the, these extremists on both the right and left who, who share this illusion because it seems like a nice idea. But not in the Middle East. Not in the real world. So we must go for the two-state way. But we fi must find new ways to do it because we the old way we tried so many times and it failed. The fourth challenge in my mind, and let's say briefly, is the relationship between the West, Israel, and the Middle East. There is no way for us to survive without a deep alliance, first of all, with this great country, but with the West in general. There is no hope for the Middle East in its dysfunctional way without some sort of Western leadership. And on the other side, the West cannot ignore this region that is going out of control. It's too big too sensitive, too dangerous. With all due respect to fracking, we are not independent even here from dealing with the Middle East. So we need to forge a new kind of relationship. And in this sense, universities, places where ideas come up, is so important. Because the relationship between the West and the Middle East and Israel was so, so distorted in the last 20, 30 years, because political correctness did not allow with people to deal with the Middle East as it is. As I like to say, the Middle East is a politically incorrect region. As long as you have politically correct terms, you don't get it. I don't think that there are many, many, many supporters of President George W. Bush here, but in case there are, I don't think President Bush went to Iraq because of oil. I totally give him the credit that he, won, he had benign intentions. He really believed in bringing democracy to Baghdad. But he didn't realize that Iraq works def differently. Look, Iraq was not thinking in American terms. It was thinking in sectarian Sunni Shiite terms. So if you have benign ideas, whether you're a conservative or a Democrat or liberal, but you do not understand the reality you're dealing with, you can bring about terrible results, although you have the best intentions. So we have to deal with this relationship. It might seem, it might seem that I'm a pessimist. I'm not. First of all, I believe in my country. I believe in my fellow Israelis. I believe that we have some unique when we, when we deal with ourselves and when people deal with us in the right way, there's enormous, enormous potential in us. But more than that, I'm a great, great believer in America. Sometimes I have to remind my American friends how great America is. So it's true, you made all these mistakes. But when you look at it in historical perspective, America gave the world its best 70 years. What we had in the world since 1945, we never had before. More peace, less wars, more freedom, less tyranny, more prosperity, less poverty. So Iraq was horrible, and Vietnam was horrible, and the United Fruit Company in South America was horrible. But give me another superpower that would have not abused its power as a superpower much more than America. Much more than America. So with all the justified criticism of American behavior, I don't see any other nation that would have given the world more hope, more reasonable stability, that would have acted with just ge such generosity like it did in Europe and in Japan. America made its mistake, but there is no alternative for American international leadership. So what I believe is that we need the new vision and the new ideas that will enable Americans, Israelis, and so many others to deal with this challenging reality in a new way that will bring new solutions. I'll be brief about my general ideas and then 
we'll discuss. Gaza first. It's a crime. It's a crime to ignore Gaza in both ways. On the one hand, it's a crime to ignore the fact that Hamas is an evil political organization. It's not the issue that I have with them as an Israeli. We are caught in this terrible tragedy of conflict, and in this tragedy, many people do terrible things. I wrote about it in my book. I cannot forgive Hamas for oppressing Palestinians. Palestinian women, Palestinian gays, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian individuals. I ask my liberal friends here and elsewhere to see that fascism is fascism even if it happens to be Palestinian fascism. The tendency to hold moral judgment when it comes to the Palestinians or to some others, in my mind, is wrong morally, wrong intellectually, and it's destructive to the Palestinian people themselves. But while we should remember what Hamas is and acknowledge what Hamas is, we cannot have a day pass without thinking about the suffering people of Gaza. There are 1.8 million people. We cannot just keep them in a prison and forget about them. They have no hope, no economy, nothing. Every day that passes that we ignore their suffering is a day of serious irresponsibility. And we should have learned. After Gaza, we should have learned. So what I think we must have is a Marshall Plan for Gaza. We must build water plants in Gaza. We must build power stations in Gaza. We must have housing projects in Gaza. Eventually, we must ask the Egyptians to give Gaza some space in northern Sinai so they will have some breathing space. We must find a way to bring the international community and the Arab world to support the people of Gaza so they will have a life and a future and hope. If we are not doing that, we are doing the wrong thing and we are endangering the future. Because this despair in Gaza will bring about the next round of violence and it might be closer than people think. Regarding Iran, two words, assertive diplomacy. I never believed, I've been a proud Iran alarmist for over a decade. I never believed in the military options. I thought that years ago it was easy to stop Iran with assertive diplomacy. Iran is still a paper tiger. Until it has nuclear teeth, it's a paper tiger. No comparison, the power of Iran, the power of the West. What you need is realism and willpower. It was so easy to stop Iran in 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009. It's more difficult today, not impossible. Why? Because God, Allah, and the Saudis combined and they brought about the collapse of oil prices. And this mutual work of God, Allah, and the Saudis gives us hope. Because Iran is under such economic pressure. They nearly won the technological uh, struggle. But they are on the brink. In this day, when they are so weak and exposed to ignore this great opportunity of stopping the Iranian nuclear project in peaceful ways, but with assertive diplomacy, I think is irresponsible. But I think if the right attitude will be endorsed, it can be done. The fourth issue has to do with what I said. I think that we need to combine new vision with the to deal with the Arab chaos and with the Palestinian issue. So I'll say briefly what my belief is. I'm afraid that with all my belief in old peace, old peace is dead. At the very least, old peace is in a coma. I don't see an Israeli prime minister and a Palestinian leader signing a final status peace agreement 
on the White House lawn. Never mind who the president is, who the prime minister is, and who's the Palestinian leader. It's not there. It failed so many times, and the circumstances have not become more favorable. But while this is the case, this not, should not lead us to despair and determinism. Because out of this Arab chaos came two sets of facts. On the one hand, no Arab, the bad news is that no moderate Arab leader has enough legitimacy to sign a peace agreement with the Zionists. If the king of Saudi Arabia wakes up in the morning, he had the dream that Herzl was Muhammad's son and the Jews are the best gift given by Allah to the Middle East. He cannot do anything about it. He is not stronger. Again, some unconvenient truth. We like to talk about peace and democracy in one sentence. But the two serious peace agreements that were achieved were between Israel and tyrants. Benevolent tyrants, but tyrants. Anwar Sadat and King Hussein. Right now, there are not, no tyrants, kings or dictators, that are strong enough, that have enough legitimacy to do another one. That's the bad news. The good news is that never, never were so many Arabs so close to Israel as today. Because they look at Iran and they are terrified. They look at ISIS, they are terrified. Islamic Brotherhood, they are terrified. Al-Qaeda, they are terrified. So they look around and they say, these Israelis, we don't like them. We have some issue with them. But they are like the one reliable neighbor we have. We can do business. So you already have some business being done between Assisi in Egypt and Israel. But I think there is a much greater potential. What we really need is a kind of American alliance with these moderate Arabs, most of them Sunnis, and Israel, moderate Israelis, and moderate Palestinians. We need to build a kind of regional er 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 structure that will promote as much as stability possible in an unstable region. Into that, you can put the pipelines of gas, because Israel has gas and it can export it to Arab countries. The water projects I mentioned, many other economical initiatives, and strategical cooperation in fighting chaos. All these players are terrified of chaos. So if you will have an anti-chaos alliance in the Middle East, led by America and the West, but with Arabs, Israelis, and Palestinians working within it, you give some hope. That won't work without dealing with what we anyhow Israelis have to deal with, which is the Palestinian issue. So if into this grand scheme you will have a kind of realistic peace process regarding Palestine, I think that will change things. Basically, what am I talking about? If we cannot sign a final status peace agreement now, Let's work with the moderate Palestinians on a kind of coordinated, sophisticated, unilateral process where we don't sign agreements, but we understand how we are doing. Our problem is occupation. We have to deal with occupation and settlements, beginning with the settlement freedoms. The Palestinians have to do their nation building, move from a negative ethos to a positive ethos, create a life for their children, a health system, education system, the good news we saw in the recent years was Salam Fayyad, my great Palestinian hero. The only good news that came out of this region. Because he tried to do that. He's now out of office, he can come back, and Fayyadism is there, even Fayyad is not there. So if we'll combine a regional structure, a regional structure, a new kind that is not like what we had in the past, with a kind of an effective process that gives more hope to Palestinians in Gaza and in the West Bank, so without solving Jerusalem and the refugees and the borders and the end of conflict, we will actually do, what we will do is launch two-state dynamics that will achieve a two-state steady state that eventually, in the long future, in the far future, will bring the two-state solution. In my mind, I'm open to any other ideas, but in my mind, only this kind of new vision, new ideas, and a new approach that combines morality with realism. Only that will make America great again in the Middle East, giving it the role it must have, 
And only that will bring Israel to what it must be. And let me end with this. I am a deep believer in my nation. With all the mistakes that we have been doing in recent decades, with all our sins and flaws, one has to remember what we are about. Israel is a man-made miracle. No other people did what we did. To build a home in our ancient home country, or ancient country, after 2,000 years. And where did we build this home? We built it under the volcano. And yet we survived. 100 years later, we survived under the volcano. But the greatest wonder of Israel, with all the criticism which we should discuss, is that it is a, it is a democracy. This is a miracle three times over. Because we came from countries that did not have democratic tradition. Whether we came from East Europe, North Africa, or the Arab world. And we came to a region that does not have democracy in it. And we are in a hundred year war. For, for three different reasons, we had every reason to become a semi-fascist entity. But we are not. Our political leadership, I'm not talking about specific people, is in my mind unworthy. Our political system is despicable. Even yours is better than ours. <laughs> but basically, Israel is a free, robust society. The spirit of Israel is the spirit of freedom. Wherever you go in Israel, you feel this vibrancy and freedom and energy and creativity and innovation. We are too free. We are like wild. So the beauty of Israel, the beauty of Israel, that we are a people that came from death and are threatened by death, but have chosen life. And we have people surrounded by tyranny who maintain against all odds a democracy. At the end of the day, the greatest challenge, the greatest challenge is for your great democracy and our frontier democracy to work together so Israel becomes once again the benign Israel it must be, a beacon for freedom and hope in the Middle East. Thank you very much. First, we want to thank you for that really wonderful and uh, very inspired uh, talk. Um, we do have some time for some uh, questions and, and, and comments, so we will certainly begin. Um, yes, Richard, please. Uh, um, can you stand up so everyone can hear? Great, thank you. <laughs> Ruby the presented six auditions <laughs> that Thank you. Uh, the movie The Gatekeepers presented six former Shin Bet leaders saying this, what I thought the two state solution is the only solution. What kind of impact has that had in Israel? Uh, it does and it does not. Um, I, I, I hope that this strong statement of these, these, uh, these Shin Bet people and, and many other generals, who are, who are, as, as I, this has to do with what I said, that most Israel's security establishment is moderate. Most, most people in Israel that are in that, those ranks are not trigger happy, are not wonger, warmongers. They know how horrible war is, and they realize how futile occupation is, so they want to change. Um, Sadly, because of Israeli politics, many of them are perceived, although they have all these uh, heroism, military heroism behind them, they are perceived as part of the, the peace elite, the, 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 the somewhat uh, snobbish Ashkenazi secular peace elite. Uh, so people listen to them, but it doesn't transform 
the mind in a dramatic way. Uh, so I think that we have one of, one of the mistakes within Israel, and it has to do with perhaps people have the Israeli elections on their minds. I think that one of the problems we have in Israel is that the Israeli, uh, what, what I call the Israeli wasps, the white Ashkenazi supporters of peace, <laughs> have, have, have totally failed politically. Uh, one, because of everything that I said. They did not bring a, 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 a realistic, creative new peace concept. So that's the one thing that we must do. The other thing is that for too many Israelis who are not so privileged, felt and still feel that these people, the elitistic, whether the business community, the military, and all that, care about the Palestinians but don't care about them. We failed in projecting a kind of social care for, for Israelis who are, who are out there suffering, having a very difficult life, and don't feel they have their place under the sun. So I think that just having some fancy generals and Shibet leaders is not enough. It's great, it's important, it's not enough. We need a new kind of movement that will not be Ashkenazi, will not be only secular, will not only be elitistic. For Peace has failed in Israel because in many ways, it's quite ironic, the Israeli left in some ways is like the old kind of Republican party here. It's a Mayflower party that actually felt that, that, that did not allow the different minorities and the Likud up to an extent succeeded in creating a Roosevelt-like minority coalition. Everything in Israel is upside down. You always have to remember that. So, so we must change that dynamics. We need the new peace concept, but we need to project, you know, Avat Israel, that we love our people, we love our nation, we love our people, we, we, we bring about social solutions, we bring more social justice, we deal with, with the entire Israeli condition. As I said in the beginning, the Israeli condition is in many ways unique, because we are like normal, the whole project, the whole idea was to create normalcy, but reality is not normal. So you have to create a kind of unique normalcy that deals with this abnormality. And we have to bring back an ethos and ideas that will deal with all the problems of all Israelis. Within that context, I'm sure that we'll be able to do what these people want us to do, which is to end occupation and, 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 and create these two-state uh, dynamics. Students? Uh, Asher, please. So today you've talked extensively about how settlements and occupation are bad for Israel, bad for its security, bad for its Jewish and democratic character. Given that, do you think that the American Jewish community has an obligation to speak out against occupation and against settlement growth, not out of some hatred of Israel, but out of love and concern for the future of our state? Well, you ask a very important question. I don't know to what extent to get into uh, the internal uh, uh, Jewish discussion here. I tried not, not to get too deep into this uh, so far. So, so let me try in, in, a, in a few sentences my, my, my vision, because there is another, talk, another world that I didn't discuss here, which is very much on my mind. So I'll say a, a few words about the American Jewish community, and then I'll, I'll answer Look, I, I go around this country and I see, first of all, I see America and its greatness and with its problems, and I see the great achievement of the American Jewish community. And I ask Jews and not Jews, who sometimes have a problem with this structure, to look, see this as a, in context as well. Because Jews came as, even in this country, as a minority that was not very much loved. And the success, not only the personal success of so many Jews in academic life, in business, in law, in medicine, in arts, whatever, but the success of this community to create a world of its own, a kind of social political world, in my mind, should not be something that people are embarrassed about, but people should be proud about. And I think it should be an example to any other minority, any other minority. So on the one hand, I see this great achievement, and, and I, you know, when I talk about it, I say there are two, two miracles here. Because the, the 20th century was the, the most dramatic century in Jewish history, and we had some before. The first half was our worst ever. We lost every third Jew. And the second half was our best ever. 
because we created the sovereignty there. And here, the perfect diaspora was created. What you have in America today is the perfect diaspora. The problem within this diaspora is your generation. Because the older people in the establishment have stopped relating to young people, have stopped listening as they should to young people. And they do not deal with what is the fundamental challenge, which is the generation gap. And the generation gap is based on the fact that the people of 70 and beyond have the Holocaust as their context and are religiously committed to Israel and Jewish life. And people over 50 remember pre-67 Israel and have a strong Jewish identity, and they whine and grind, but they cannot help it. They're with it. So this made this great, perfect diaspora with all its congregations and organizations and federations and whatever. But the young generation, your generation, as you know better than I, but I'm becoming a bit of an expert on this as myself, <laughs> is in a different world. Because within the people under 30, on the one hand, there are so many people who have warmth to, towards Israel. It's something they've learned from their parents or their grandparents or their rabbis, the Jewish education or a great birthright experience they had. So there is warmth and care. But for so many others, Israel is either a bit remote or what more, more problematic, Israel is a bit of an issue because there is a tension between their liberal identity, their progressive identity, and Israel. This is the most dramatic challenge for the Jewish people and for the American Jewish community. I think the only way to deal with this is not to censor, not to shut up young people, but to listen to young people, as I try to do here in, in Dartmouth, and to be engaged in a candid conversation. So I'm, I'm thinking of all kinds of ideas that might be helpful, but let me say the, the beginning of my conclusion. First of all, free discussion. You cannot keep Israel as a cliche. We have to deal, I so much love Israel and believe in Israel that I think we, we, we can deal with the problems and flaws without being scared. We, the, the only way to project real love is if you deal with the real identity. If you make Israel into some sort of marble statue, no one, no one can really love a marble statue. And the older generation have in mind Paul Newman. They have Exodus in their mind. And if Israel is not as handsome as Paul Newman, something is wrong. Now, I think it's the wrong attitude, definitely for the younger generation. Because we, I, 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 I always say, you know, we Israelis, we are not, so many people assume we are either angels or demons. We are not angels. We don't want to break your heart, but we are not angels. And we are definitely not de demons. We are humans. I think we are rather remarkable humans with an astounding human story. And this is why I wrote my book, and this is why I, I talk about it. I think it's, when you look at the human endeavor Israel is, if you're not heartless, it's an inspiring, amazing story. But there are so many problems in it. So, so deal with the problems. And then get engaged, because I think that the one thing I don't want to see within this world, we have to understand that, the, again, so many people assume the Jews have become a Goliath. Israel is a Goliath, and Jews here are a Goliath. It's not the case. It's not the case. There are only 14 million Jews in the world. We are endangered here and there. We contributed so much to civilization, but such large parts of civilizations have issue with us. So we are, don't let the success here and there blind you to what's the real situation. I sometimes say we, we are we're actually an underdog on steroids. Okay, we, we saw our fundamental, because you look, definitely when you look at Israel, demographically, geographically, historically, but, but here as well. So the way to engage in my mind is totally free discussion and then not to have inter-Jewish isolationism. So I want any person here to find the Israel he can relate to, whatever way. So if you are into gay rights, do gay rights. And environment, do environment. If you are women rights, women rights, whatever. And, and be engaged and, and say, speak your mind. If you don't like, if things are wrong, say it. I don't think that, 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 that this attitude, that the real life is there because we are risking ourselves and therefore you cannot say that's wrong from a Jewish point of view, not only from, from, from a moral and progressive point of view. 
Let's have a free discussion. Let's look for the shared values. The, the whole thing won't work if we will not bring the shared values again. So we need the shared values between America and Israel. We need the shared values between younger American Jews like yourself and young Israelis. I think that free discussion, new kind of projects, and that will make, that will help in fixing Israel on the one hand, but on the other hand, enable people to be proud of Israel and love Israel passionately. Look, you, you, you see me. I, it's not that I pay lip service. I love Israel passionately, really passionately. That doesn't mean that I don't have a lot of criticism and that I'm willing to hear even things that, you know, burn my ears. I've heard in recent weeks some things that, you know, very difficult for me to hear. But I think that only free discussion, free engagement, and new fresh ideas that will inspire young people like yourself. We have time for two more questions. I'm always, um, we always want to give it to students. Uh, but Afa, did you have your hand? Um, no? Okay, because it's always interesting to hear from you. Uh, at least you want to invite yeah. So um, in your book, I remember one of the most salient things I remember was that you said that Israel doesn't have a peace partner. Um, and so I'm just wondering, um, how then do you expect if they give up the, these, if Israel gives up these settlements, that that will have, like what kinds of ramifications do you expect that to have in terms of peace with the Palestinians? So first of all, I don't remember the specific sentence, but perhaps, you know, there are too many sentences in the book, perhaps I don't remember them all. But, 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 but I'll tell you, you know, seriously, what I think we must build the peace part. There, there are two different issues here. One, that even if there is no peace, I hope we will have peace, but even if there is no peace, we need a line. That our, our goal has to be really to maintain the Jewish democratic state that will be really democratic. As I, and again, because I have arguments with people on the two extremes, in my mind, you have to understand that Israel will not be Jewish if it will not be totally democratic, totally respecting the full rights and liberties of non-Jews in Israel. And Israel will not be democratic if it will not be Jewish. Because the way the Middle East works, there are no neutral identities. You need some sort of identity. And sometimes some Americans have difficulty with that. Because you are the one democracy in the world that totally ignored the ethnical element and the peoplehood element. Most democracies in the world are nation states built on a certain people that you judge how they treat the minorities. If we stay in the, in the borders we are now, it will either stop being Jewish or will stop being democratic. There is no way you can have 40, 45 percent Palestinian or 50 percent population that has no rights. It, it just doesn't fly, doesn't work. So even if there is no peace, we have for our own identity, for our own soul, and for our own security. We have to change the reality in the West Bank. We have to do it in a wise way, careful way, gradual way, creative way. But we have to do it, even if there is no peace. My hope is that we can build peace. So I'll tell you where my hope is. Not only do I have you hope with young Palestinians, again, Things are moving also with young Israelis in both ways. Some go more to extreme, some are more. I think that long-term globalization works. And long-term, what the chaos we see now in the Middle East will be replaced with something different. People do want to live, want, you know, they, they do look, they, they want their life to resemble America more than they want it to, to, to resemble ISIS. So, so I think there is hope, but again, you have to work in a cautious, patient way. So if we will work with giving hope to Palestinian youngsters, working with the Palestinian business class, working with the Palestinian business community, on all, that, now all these moderate forces cannot do final status. They cannot sign a peace agreement. But if we'll create a process where every year there is a bit more hope to the Palestinians, they have more space economically, politically, I think we, 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 we generate good, whether it will bring a kind of, of idyllic peace like you have with Canada, I doubt it. It won't happen in a few years. Long term, I hope it will happen. But we have to stop occupation to guarantee the Jewish democratic state within safe borders and legitimate borders, and to give peace the best shot possible. And if it's not there right now, let us build it. Just 
one more question, Mr. Bengal. Uh, hmm. I haven't called on a faculty person yet. There is. Um, there is. I see there's people Sorry. back yeah, there. Yeah. Okay, there's a gentleman back there, and then I'm going to. Um, and then. So uh, perhaps you can Bengal. combine two or three, and then. We'll sure, sure, sure. Okay. Should be good, and then we'll need to stop. Because. Um, uh, yeah, way up at the top there. Uh, wait for the microphones for everyone to hear. So when you were answering his question, you said that um, the liberal Jewish Americans who are disconnected from Israel are the biggest problem, not the Jewish Americans who had an awesome time on their birthright trips, but the ones who think that their liberal ideology conflicts with um, certain policies in Israel. Why is that? Why, why shouldn't those people be the ones that are connecting? Like, why, why can't we have a system set up where you, um, the, like, they have a connection to Israel and they're, they're not the problem, they're the future of Israel in the United States by furthering policies where the United States can pressure Israel to change? I, 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 I didn't quite get it. Can, can you just, so you're asking? What? Why, why is it that you think that the, the liberal, ideologically disconnected why Jews do they matter are the problem? More? Why do they matter? In, in our generation, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, so let's take two more and I'll, I'll go on. What are the others? Yes, and, um, sure. Um, what is it, how do you think that uh, Judaism as a religion and the teachings of the Torah can relate to the modern day conflicts and potential hopeful um, thoughts of peace and uh, the future of Israel? Uh, my question is of a somewhat different kind, but I'm sure you'll be able to weave it into one answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, it's a two-part question, and they're more interrelated than might the, seem at the, first. The weaving is already becoming more complicated. Yeah. <laughs> So, how would you respond to a claim that uh, Israel is actually trapped in the West Bank and that it is Palestinian long-term interest to keep Israel trapped in the West Bank? And, for another perspective on, I think, exactly the same issue, the last time the area was more or less decent was during uh, the height of the Ottoman Empire. Is there any conceivable arrangement of that area that will be decent again without emulating that model? So let me begin with that. I'll, I'll do it this way. Um, uh, so first of all, definitely, I think Israel, you're, I think your, your first part of your question is totally, well, first I appreciate the, both parts, but I think that Israel definitely is trapped in the West Bank. And now I'm not sure if there is some extreme, if extreme Palestinians have a mega sophisticated genius strategy or just some dynamics. But the result is that we are trapped because what happens is that the situation is, as I said, killing us from within. And then every time we try to move, we try to pull out, they respond with violence and then we are trapped. And then, the, so, so this is exactly, this is the catch. And, and this is why I think we, it's such, such a challenge. And, and this is why I think that, first of all, this is what makes the settlement freeze, I think, much easier. And I, when I say settlement freeze, I mean settlement freeze beyond the blocks. It's, it's, and I won't get to the details of that. And I think that the settlement freeze is the one thing we can do tomorrow morning. We could have done it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because it doesn't endanger our security. It, 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 right now, the settlement building, is, 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 it kills a two-state option. Even if there is no two-state solution, it keeps you know, the two-state option is bleeding to death. So this is something we have to do, and then, we have to, we need this sophisticated process, creative process led by America, but monitored by America, but the partners have to be very active to deal with what you're saying. Because we need every, my vision is that after the settlement freeze, we withdraw from small parts of the West Bank, we cannot take huge risks, and wherever we withdraw, a Palestinian city is being built, like the city of Rawabi, which gives Palestinians hope and, and, and work and jobs. So it's not Hamas like in Gaza, but you work with the constructive Palestinians, with, with the Fayaz and the Al-Masris, with these Palestinians who want life for their, for their 
for, for the sons and daughters. So, but would we, and we must do it to get out of the trap. Now, do I fully believe in the Ottoman, you know, there were some problems with the Ottoman uh, um, uh, model. I mean, my, my family is long enough in the country. We have a lot of uh, memories from Ottoman. It, it wasn't all perfect. But I agree that, ironically, modernity and, you know, there is the, I don't want to get into it, but I, a big, I have a kind of dialogue with the late Edward C., you know, and, and, and who, who criticizes so much, you know, the West and all, all that. Under the Turks and even under the British, after all, you had much more pluralism in the Middle East and with communities living side by side in a kind of balanced way, which was lost when nationalism first and now Islamic uh, uh, political, extreme political Islam took over and drove away the minorities. So in some sort of 21st century structure would have to look at the beauty, the, 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 the promising uh, elements of the, the old Ottoman structure because there was, some, there was something to it. Uh, we cannot go back to it. We should not go back to it, but, but there are elements of it giving different communities an ability to coincide, to live, to coexist, uh, 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 and not just, just fight uh, one another all the time. And which brings me exactly to your point, which is, I'm, look, I'm not a religious person. I've, I, I'm a very committed Jew. I've, I, I'm committed to my, my, my tradition, to my, 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 the culture I come from, the, the legacy, the learning. I'm not religious personally. The Middle East is a religious region. Part of the mistakes of the old peace process that it ignored the religious dimension. So although I'm not religious myself, definitely part of, I'm talking on the one hand on all kinds of prag pragmatic steps that have to be like neutral, but the deeper process of reconciliation will have to have a religious element. So I really think, and, and it goes with what you said, we need, and, and I'm all for you know, the dialogues between the imams and the rabbis and all that, and, and we need part of the, and, and you know, Oslo was a wonderful attempt to bring peace, but it was a Scandinavian initiative between Tel Aviv Yapis and Ramallah Yapis. And you need, to address identity, you need to address tradition. You need, and, and I think one of the reasons, for instance, that the peace agreement with Egypt works is that Anwar Sadat came with all his nationalism as a proud Egyptian national, and Menachem Begin with, came with all as a proud Jewish national. And making peace like that, not ignoring identity, not ignoring the past, but bringing and then making it more sublime, that's peace. So, so we need. We'll need that element, and I'm, I'm very thankful for the question, because it, it will have to be this new piece I talk about will not, cannot only be based on gas, uh, on, 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 on gas pipes and water plants that are very important. It needs a spiritual dimension, and the spiritual dimension in the Middle East in the coming 100 years has to be, ha, ne would need a religious element. By the way, it's one of the ways to fight ISIS. You want to work with moderate uh, uh, Muslims and moderate Jews and moderate Christians, um, most Christians in the Middle East are moderate because they're such a minority, but among Jews and Muslims, are, we have some problems here and there. So, <laughs> so, so, so we need to bring that benign uh, religiosity and, and, and a benign way of dealing with identity issues because identity politics is so much at the heart of it. Which brings me to your, your question there regarding uh, wh why do I care so much about the more progressive youngsters? Well, first of all, because the progressive youngsters are the vast majority. As far as I know, from, definitely from what I see in the universities, first of all, you know, 85% of young Jews go to universities. Within universities, I think 85, 90% are Obama voters. So, so this is where the people are. So the fact that there is a minority that is very committed doesn't have all this problem because they had a very strong education or because they are modern orthodox or because of whatever. You know, I, I, I love anyone who loves my country. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But they have to look at where the people really are. And, and, and as I said, I'm becoming a bit of an expert in it. And what I see, look, on, on the, this is my 10th and last campus on this one. I was in three in December and I was in 10 before that. And I'm going to another 20. I might be another even smart, a bit, a bit smart about it by summer. But from what I see, 
it's so clear that there are two, within this Jewish challenge, there are two main issues. One is just apathy. That, that there are so many people who, who, who do not know why they should care. They, they do not know. And it's a huge issue. You know, there are so many, again, uh, Israelis and Jewish establishment people who are worried about BDS, and I'm very worried about BDS. I'm very worried. But apathy is more dangerous than BDS. Apathy is the most dangerous. But apathy has to do with the other issue as well, because this tension between progressive values in Israel. I'm not saying, I, I'm a liberal Zionist. That's my middle name is liberal Zionist. I mean, I, I don't think that on merit, on substance, there is a tension. But the way things are perceived, because the left went so much to the left, and Israel went so much to the right, many people feel there is a tension there. And my, I'm here in order to try to change that. I think that for too long, there was a too deep alliance between Tea Party America and Tea Party Israel. And it's time to change that dynamics and to create a passionate, meaningful alliance between non-Tea Party America and non-Tea Party Israel. I think it's right on merit. I think Israel needs it. I think we need it for the American-Israeli alliance. And I think we need it for the Jewish people. So, so what happened is not only that the, you, you're losing so many progressive young Jews, you drive many others to apathy. Because if Israel is so radioactive and it's so complicated and you don't know and, and you're, you're told by your parents and your rabbis you must defend it, but then on, on, on Facebook you are attacked for defending it and you don't have, you don't have a strong vision and, and it doesn't inspire you, you, you like give up on the whole thing and you just stay home or, or in your fraternity. So I think that it's, it's time to bring back a new passionate, inspiring liberal Zionism. I think that, it, again, first of all, I'm there myself. That's what I believe in. But I think this is the best way of dealing with this issue. How to do it, we have to discuss. And I said to all the young people here, I'm into, I, I don't have the answers. I want a candid discussion. I'm looking for ideas. I think we should discuss it. But the fact that this is where we should go, I think, is so clear. The only way to maintain the two miracles, the miracle of Israel and the miracle of the perfect diaspora is to renew liberal Zionism in a big, passionate, and inspiring way. Thank you very much. Thank you.